Hello, and welcome back to another episode of The Wolf Queen, The Hope of a Fairy Read Along with me, the author, Cerise Rennie Murphy. I hope that you are well and that you've had a good day. And if you're listening to this at the beginning of the day, I hope your day goes well. I want to jump right in today because when we left Amina, she was getting into the Here's Carriage in chapter 15. And I want to pick up right where we left off with chapter 16, Wet Emedi. And I'll tell you what that means at the end. The moment his footman closed the carriage door, they were off. Inside, the curtains were closed so tightly that the only light between them came from two red candles that flickered from heavy wrought iron scones. The hearer settled back in his seat, as if sitting on a throne. Amina thought he had never, she had never seen him look so serene or sure of his command of the situation before him. With arms stretched out on either side, his posture displayed the gold embroidery that accented his traditional black and red attire. In the confines of the carriage, his robes were so voluminous that his thin frame took up the entire seat. Finally, we are alone. For a girl who lives so deep in the forest, you certainly have a lot of friends. In the close confines, his voice was darkly seductive, like a shadow beckoning her closer. Though his skin skin clung tightly to the sharp bones underneath, its dark brown hue was smooth and flawless, without a trace of facial hair. With a few pounds added and a genuine smile, Amina could imagine how, in a certain light, that ma- that masked the shadow, the strange hollow of his eyes, one might mistake him for handsome. Samin Jaleen and his family have been kind to me, she replied, willing her voice to remain calm. You've known them for a long time then? The hearer's eyes drifted away, suddenly interested in some imaginary thread on the hem of his sleeve. Since I was a child. When he did not react, Amina began to suspect that his line of questioning was more a test than an inquiry. How much does he know about my mother, about me, she wondered. I see, he replied, with eyes kept low. And how did a girl child come to live alone at the end of the world? Amina racked her brain for a lie that would justify the extreme life she'd chosen for herself, but nothing but the truth would suffice. Well, perhaps not all of it, she thought. He may be arrogant, but he's not a stupid man, she warned herself. Do not underestimate him. (laughs) My family was taken from me, murdered in the night. I've lived on my own ever since. Oh, I'm sorry to hear of it. Those were dark times. Dark, dark times. The hearer returned his eyes to hers without a trace of remorse in his voice, and suddenly she knew. This is a trap, just as sincere warned me it would be. He knows exactly who I am. As if reading her mind, the hearer's veneer of gentility slipped just enough to reveal a knowing smirk. Amina held her breath against the instinct to scream. Outside, she could not hear Nasir's carriage, but she hoped that he was close, but not close enough to stop what I've already begun. The sweet scent of the burning candles, with it, which at first had been, only been annoying, now made Amina's head throb with pain. The red wax crept down the side of the scones, making the entire display look like it was dripping with blood. She closed her eyes against a sudden wave of nausea. Well, the important thing is that you're here now, isn't it? After all my searching, I've finally found you. And look how magnificent you are in that dress. I wonder if it would be worth all the trouble it took. I wondered if it would be worth all the trouble it took to make. But I knew once you saw it, you would not be able to refuse my invitation. Amina's body felt flush and her throat hoarse with a sudden burning heat. The cloying scent of the candles made it more and more difficult for her to breathe. You seem uncomfortable, my dear. 
quite the opposite of what I'd intended. Our carriage is long enough for you to lie down, if you like. Now he's toying with me, she thought, forcing her eyes open, but I won't give in so easily. Her voice was low but clear as she answered, No thank you, Tahir. It's just the scent of the candles. I find it a bit too sweet for my liking. That is a shame. I had them made especially for you. His lips smiled, but his eyes were piercing. Instinctively, Amina loosened the shawl from around her neck and clutched the amulet she always wore. Help me, Ina. Help me. Might we open the window, she asked, for forcing herself to take slow, measured breaths. Around her, the dress clung, began to pulsate in a calming rhythm. The hear's eyes followed her, her grasp to the object around her neck. A short hiss escaped his lips as a flash of rage rippled across his face. My dear, what is that awful thing you're wearing around your neck? Amina watched his right hand disappear into the folds of his clothes. It was my mother's, she said calmly, remembering what the Shri had told her. He sees, but he cannot truly understand what it is. What kind of a mother would leave her daughter such an ugly thing? I'm afraid to say it simply will not do, the here cooed. His face began to relax as he bought a heavy gold link chain from a disguised pocket in his robe. I intended to give this to you upon my arrival, but your guests distracted me. The memory of their presence vexed him, but he would not let it keep him from his goal any longer. Once she wears my chain, he thought. Amina closed her eyes and focused on the rhythm of the dress to fight back the dizziness that clouded her mind, keeping her left hand clutched to the rough stone that had grown strangely warm beneath her skin. She used her right hand to reach under the window curtain. She pressed her palm firmly to the thin pane, reveling in the cool air that rushed past the glass. Instinctively, she felt more focused. In the distance, she heard the sharp howl of a wolf. The hear inched forward in his seat as he watched sweat form on Amina's brow. Why isn't it working? He seethed silently. His alchemist, Nafar, had promised that the candles would work as long as she had no access to the outside elements. She must submit to me. The hear stood up. Take it off, he commanded, finally at the end of his patience. When Amina opened her eyes, she was surprised to find him hunched over her in the carriage, reaching for her with a gold necklace in his hand. I can't, she replied. The jagged edges of the amulet cut into her palms, but she still but still she held it close. Where it burned from the heat of whether it burned from the heat of her own body or some unknown power, she could not say, but she would not let go. What makes you think you can defy me, girl? I promised I would never take it off. I never have, and I never will. The here examined the hideous necklace more carefully. It's too crude to be the amulet of the Amasidi, he decided before moving forward. We will see about that, he snarled, reaching for her throat with the gold necklace in hand. Without thinking, Amino swung her right hand from the window pane and smacked his arm away from her. The necklace flew from his hand, skidding across the carriage floor. Incensed, the here darted away to retrieve it from the floor, then lunged at her throat again. The light from the candle burned in his eyes like madness, but before he could reach her, the carriage suddenly jolted, throwing him back into his seat. Outside, the air around them erupted with savage growls. The screams of the footmen behind them were followed by a loud crash. By the time they heard the footman scream again, his voice was an echo in the distance as their carriage raced away. Jacob! The here called to his driver. What's happening? Despite the brief commotion and the eerie silence that followed, the driver did not stop or slow his pace. Still clutching her necklace, Amina pressed her back against her seat, trying to stay as far away from the here as she could. A new danger was coming, but not for her. With one hand anchored to the cushion for balance, the here used his other fist to bang on the carriage roof. Jacob, answer me! What the hell is going on? I don't know, Jahir, Jacob stammered. I think we may be under attack. 
What do you mean, maybe? Who would dare? The hero pulled the curtain and opened the window. Quickly, Amina slid to the other side of the carriage, with the necklace still wrapped around her fingers. The hero pressed his hand, I'm sorry, with the necklace still wrapped between his fingers, the hero pressed his hand against the window frame and leaned his head out. At first, he could see nothing close to them in the vast plains that lay between the palace at Merimasia. The only sound he heard in the darkness was the wheels of their carriage rattling along the road as the driver raced ahead. Once his eyes adjusted in the distance, the hear saw the faint outline of Nasir's family carriage, but they were, far, they were too far behind to be of any consequence to his plans. They're too late, he thought remembering Nasir's feeble attempt to prevent him, to prevent Amina from traveling with him. At least Jalene is no fool. It doesn't matter now anyway. Soon we will be home and Amina will submit to me, one way or another. What are you talking about? The hero yelled towards Jacob. There's nothing out here. From inside the carriage, Amina heard the sound of large claws drawing back against the polished wood top of the carriage. From the sudden turn of his head, Amina could see that the hear heard it as well, but not soon enough to save him. He looked up to find the large face of a tan wolf growling down at him. The attack came from two sides. Frozen in terror at the presence of the first wolf, he did not see the second lean in from behind the carriage to bite his hand, taking two fingers and the necklace they held with it. For a moment, the hear forgot about the wolf above his head, staring in disbelief at his ravaged hand. But he remembered just in time to meet the paw that came down to scrape its claws across the side of his face. Pain finally found its voice as the force of the blow knocked him to the carriage floor, bleeding and wounded at Amina's feet. Without a thought, Amina reached for the door, ready to jump out of the moving carriage until a thought stayed her hand. If I leave now, how will I find her? Even as the here's prisoner, Amina knew she had a better chance of finding her mother than if she were anywhere else. Atop the carriage, Amina could hear the anxious scratching of the, of the wolf's claws, her wolf's claws, against the roof as she howled. Suddenly she understood. She's beckoning me, beckoning me with her. I can't, she thought. There's something I must do. As soon as she made the decision, Amina felt the carriage pass from soft dirt to the paved stone of the long palace driveway and knew, no matter what happened, there was no going back. Outside the palace, guards shouted as they raced towards their liege. Wolves! The hero is under attack! Shoot them down! Run, she thought. Run away before they catch you. The wolf howled again, and this time she knew she understood. Go, she commanded, then felt the carriage rock with the force of two wolves leaping off and away. Behind her, the hear whimpered and cursed. In the time she decided not to escape, he managed to roll to his knees and wrap his torn hand in the fabric from his robe. From his crouch, he glared at her, fury mixed with the blood and torn flesh that ran down his face. There was also a wild excitement, too and a lust in his eyes that made Amina's skin crawl. Did you send them, he asked. His voice was strained with pain. Though Amina knew the answer, she refused to say the words out loud. She had not sent them, yet somehow they had come. They had come for her. Just as they had during the bandit's attack, they had sensed she was in danger and came to save her. Though she still did not understand why, Amina could not deny the strange connection any more. As if taken by some fit of madness, the hear suddenly began to howl at her mockingly before descending into laughter. The moment the carriage driver pulled up the horses, the hear's guards opened the door to find their leader maimed and bloody with Amina unharmed beside him. And no matter how she felt, no one could save her from the path she'd chosen. Well, there is no one here to save you now, the hear sneered. The hear sneer was grotesque as blood ran down his teeth and out the other side of his ruined mouth. But Amina could not look away because for once she knew he was right.
And that is chapter 16. I'll see you next time when we listen to chapter 17, Maramasia, and find out what happens to Amina now that she is firmly in the hero's clutches. I hope you enjoyed that. I love a good action scene, and I really enjoyed having the wolves take a bite out of that here. But anyway, I hope you're well and you stay well until we meet again. Take care. All my love.